Good morning. So we are 12 days into the new year, and how are those resolutions coming? I uh, make resolutions. I started this about four or five years ago. My resolutions have been to make no resolutions because I never seem to follow them. But uh, if you were to guess, what do you think the number one New Year's resolution is? Lose weight. Yep, that's it. What do you think number two is? Quit smoking. Somebody said it. Yeah, right? Uh, stop, you know, lose weight, stop smoking. So there's a lot of people throughout the world, uh, they, will, they will make these resolutions and they'll try to follow them. And many of them will get about 30 days in, some 60. And then they just start to, uh, uh, start to go away and fade off. And I was looking this week and I found a couple that I thought were really interesting. I wanted to show to you. Uh, this first one, this person says, I've decided to leave my past behind me. Uh, so if I owe you any money, I'm sorry, but I've moved on. And so, I mean, I think that's, that's a pretty good resolution, right? Uh, that was a good one. This person says, I never again will I take sleeping pills and laxatives on the same night. Uh, if you don't know what would happen there, I just try it. Uh, give it a try, and you'll, you'll get firsthand experience with that. Uh, Jim Gaffigan says, my New Year's resolution, uh, I will be less lazy. If you don't get that one, there's, okay, never, never mind. But, uh, so yeah, New Year's resolutions, I don't, I, I don't do them. Um, I want to ask you, so you, you have all been part, probably part of a group of people in a room at some point where there's just something off, uh, there's a problem, you all know it, but nobody wants to address it, nobody wants to say anything about it. Maybe it looks something like this, take a look. All right, everybody sit. I've got three items on the docket. First, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Francine, happy birthday. So how many of you have seen Zootopia? If you haven't, you need to see that great movie. Hey, we are starting a series of messages this morning. We're going to call them Elephant in the Church. You've been part of that, like we said, this elephant in the room. We want to take it a step further and these elephant in the church. And uh, this is going to be a very interesting series of messages as we go through this. We originally had planned this to be this month through next month. Uh, but honestly, as we're putting this together, I don't know when it's going to end. Uh, I can promise you this sometime before Easter. Uh, we're confident in that. Um, but no, uh, most likely here the next uh, six weeks, we're going to break it uh, in the middle, uh, the first Sunday in February, uh, our crew from the Dominican Republic is heading down next week. Uh, they're going to share with you that morning, and then we'll pick back up again. Uh, but we're going to hit some of these topics that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And quite honestly, I'm a little nervous myself. You know, I've been doing some studying on it, and it's some interesting things. You know, we, we saw it on the screen, uh, divorce, uh, generation gap, uh, the gaps in generations, sexuality, uh, mental health, addictions, uh, and so on and so forth. And we want to look at uh, the biblical mandate. What does God say about these th things? Because we believe, I believe, that the Bible does speak on all of these things. I believe it does. I believe God speaks very clearly on them. And uh, we want to uh, talk about some of them in the coming weeks. So if you have your message notes this morning and you want to pull those out, I encourage you to do it. Uh, we're going to kind of utilize this morning, uh, kind of like a teaching morning. Uh, we, we do that quite a bit from time to time, but we want to really look at this this morning from, from a teaching perspective. And as we move into this series and we look at uh, all these different tough topics, these elephants in the church, if you will, I believe the foundation of all of them has to start with our identity. I believe that. Who are we? Who are we? Now, if I would ask you the question this morning, who are you? I want to take it a step further. Uh, I'm going to give you an assignment. Now, whether you choose to accept it or not, that's up to you. You don't have to. But you got one week to write a one-page paper and answer the question, who are you? Now, here's the rules. You can't use your name. You can't use names of family, friends, pets, anything like that. You cannot use your jobs or talk about your jobs. You can't mention your hobbies. I don't want to know about you, I want to know you. Now, how would you answer that? And that kind of begs the question to all of us as to what the basis 
of our identity really is. What is the basis to our identity? Now, to answer this question, I feel like we have to look at two possible approaches for our identity, two different approaches. The first one being this, that our identity comes from the world or our our identity comes from the word. Uh, Our identity comes from what society says, what they have kind of drilled into us, what they have taught us over time, or our identity comes from the word of God. What does God say about it? What's he have to say about who we are and who he's made us to be? Let's look at that, our identity from the world to start with. Our, the world really measures our identity in four ways. Now, if you've been part of us, our, our family here for the last, uh, you know, even couple weeks, uh, you've, you've seen these four things. Uh, we, we've talked about it a few times, but I want to unpack them a little bit more this morning. So the, the world measures our value in four different ways. First of all, our appearance, how we look, uh, our achievements, what we've done, our acquisitions, who we, uh, or what we own, and our associations, who we know. Our uh, appearance, our achievements, our our acquisitions, and our associations. Now, if we measure our appearance, the value of our appearance, then it's always changing. It's always changing because our appearance is always changing. Think about that. Most of us, all of us maybe, don't look like we did 20 years ago. For a lot of us, that's a good thing. For some of us, we might not like that. I know me personally, from about the eyes down, maybe the top of the eyes down, I kind of wish I looked like I did 20 years ago. But honestly, from the forehead up, I'm glad I don't, even with the coloration. I mean, when I was in high school, early high school, I had straight hair, even though it was, I made it straight, and I would feather it straight back with a hard part right down the middle. I looked like a royal idiot. But that, and, and it looked the best right after the barber cut it because it was feathered perfectly. Every hair was right where it needed to be. And I had confidence. I'd walk out of that barber shop, my shoulders held high, my chest out, even though it was pretty flat and bony, but I held it out. And then, as I got in, this is, I can't believe I'm admitting this, but then, in, in late high school, my senior year, I think it was, um, there's two women in my life that I value more than any other women prior to Kim, and that was my mother and my Aunt Jackie. My mom and my Aunt Jackie, they were the two number one people in my life, number two, two top women in my life. And they like curly hair. <laughs> no joke, they, I, I like, this is funny. They, they like curly hair, so I got a perm. <laughs> I did. I got a perm with straight on the sides, and perm up here, uh, I would go to basketball games. They called me Pepe Le Pew. I didn't see, I don't understand how that, at any rate. And uh, my mom loved it. My Aunt Jackie loved it. I didn't care about anybody else. I uh, cut it all off my, my uh, freshman year in college and uh, to my mom's dismay, but it was gone. So I, I'm glad I don't look like that. But, but we are, our, our appearance is constantly changing. And when we value our, our, who we are, based on appearance, we see that it's not a reliable basis for one's self-esteem. We've seen so many examples. Some of you maybe have witnessed this. Some of you have been part of this, of tragedies in life, of fires, um, uh, uh, accidents, car accidents, where our appearance has changed. And it's altered who we are in our own minds. We don't look the same way. We look in the mirror and we see something different. People will judge us. People will look at us differently. People will not associate with us because of our appearance that has changed. It's proof that one's appearance is not a reliable basis for one's self-esteem. Solomon said this in Proverbs 31, charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. So we see that appearance is not a reliable resource for our value and our identity. Or how about achievements? If we would base our, our identity based on what we achieve, how would we ever know that we've achieved enough? There's always somebody who's going to achieve more. There's always somebody who has achieved less. And we have, uh, we've engaged ourselves in this endless cycle of comparing ourselves to others. We feel good. We feel proud when we've achieved more than somebody, or we feel inferior when we haven't Uh, achieved enough compared to somebody else. And it's this endless cycle 
go on and on. Paul was very wise when he said in Galatians 6, I will never boast about anything except the cross of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or in Philippians, he says, I do not put uh, confidence in the flesh. Paul knew this. Interesting because he came from a lifestyle where appearance and achievements meant everything. And all of a sudden, through his faith in Christ, it changed. He said, I'm not going to put my faith in, in what I've achieved and who I am. It's, it's who he's made me to be. My God in heaven has made me to be. And so accomplishments, while they're important, they were never intended to be the basis for our identity. Well, how about acquisitions? You know, it's true that materialism at its very root causes low self-esteem. Materialism at its very root causes low self-esteem. People spend a lifetime. You know people like this. They will spend a lifetime acquiring wealth, the biggest house, the best vehicles, the best lifestyle, the best bank account, and thinking that, that, that this Increase in wealth is going to be increased in self-esteem and self-worth. We so desperately want to feel good about ourselves that we will literally buy confidence. I know people like this. Names come to mind right now for some of you, people like that. They will buy their confidence. And so if the measure of our value and our identity is the size of our house, how nice a car we drive, the size of our bank account, what happens when it's all gone? You know, I've been in ministry for a long time. I've been to and officiated many, many funerals. And you know I have yet to see a hearse pulling a U-Haul? You just don't see it. You don't see it. Every corpse in every coffin has empty pockets. Paul writes, or excuse me, Proverbs 11 says, Paul didn't write this. He wasn't around yet, I don't think. Proverbs 11, it says, when a sinful man dies, his hope dies with him, and all his power, or some uh, versions would say riches, comes to nothing. So our acquisition is not a a good way to measure our identity. Gary Black said, having a million doesn't always make you feel like a million. That's so true. Associations, what about associations? You know, a lot of people believe that if they know somebody important or somebody that's important in society's eyes, then it makes us important. And we'll spend, again, a lifetime building relationships, networking. Um, you're trying to be around influential people that is somehow going to help us be influential and be somebody important. Here's the truth about relationships. They're transient. You know this. As we change, relationships change. Many of you do not have those close relationships, the same close relationships you might have had 15, 20, 25 years ago. I used to tell our high school kids and all the time, middle school, mostly high school, when I was in youth ministry, that these friends, while they're, they're important, most likely, it's just the way it works, most likely they will not be your close friends a decade from now or two decades from now. Others will come into your life, those that you're really going to rely on. I still have contact with many of my high school friends, uh, a few of them rather, but they're not my closest friends. They're not the ones I'm calling. They're not the ones I'm going to. They're not the ones I'm seeing face-to-face on a regular basis. God's brought others into my life. They change. It's the reality. Paul writes in Colossians 2, he says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. Who is the head over every ruler and every authority? Christ is our head. Christ is our identity. Christ is the one who never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the one, our association, who is the most valuable, has the most notoriety, the most important, and never changes. And Paul says, that's who I want to identify with. So if we look at this, appearance, achievements, acquisitions, associations, the reality is they're about as dependable as building your dream home on sand. And why would we invest in that? Why would we invest resources and money into that? And if that's the case, then why would we invest our lives into that? 
It doesn't work. The identity from the world simply doesn't work. So what does work? I want to propose this morning that it's the identity in the Word, the Word of God that works in finding out who we are and who He's created us to be. If you have your Bibles, turn with me or device, turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, and although we're going to look at several different scriptures this morning, we're going to bounce around, this is really going to be our foundation. Because if we're to look at our identity, who we are, then we've got to model it after someone or something, and in particular, someone, and that comes from Christ. Our, our foundation of our belief system as Christians has to be modeled on Christ himself. He is our model. He's the one who came, fully God, fully man, walked this earth to model what it is to be a Christian and seek after God the Father in heaven. And this is a beautiful picture in John 13 of Jesus knowing his identity, knowing where he came from, knowing who he is, and exactly where he was going. Isn't that what we want? To know where we've come from, to know who we are right now, and to know where we're going. Jesus knew that full well. And we see that here in John chapter 13. Follow along with me the first five verses. It says this, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that the hour had come. He was going to leave this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. Now, a couple comments here. First of all, Jesus knew that there would be one who would betray him. There would be one who would deny him and all who would desert him for a time. He knew that. And yet still, Jesus took on the nature of a servant. This King of kings, Lord of lords, who had come to die, that we may have life. You see, in those times, it was the servants who would put on the apron, the servants who would get down on their knees, and they would wash the feet of the guests that would come into the homes. It wouldn't be a whole body thing. It would only be the feet, the dirtiest part of the body. The part that most people didn't want to look at. I don't know about you, but, you know, some... Uh, some people have these toe phobias, foot phobias. I think there's a word for that that ends in phobia or obia or bia or something. You know, toes going funky ways and nails, and it's just, oh, like make your stomach go gross, right? And, and this is what they would do. They'd welcome guests in, and they wash those feet. And Jesus knew that, and he knew there was people in the room, one in the room that was going to betray him, one in the room that was going to deny him. Many, many, many that would not believe and turn away. And what does Jesus do? Jesus takes off his outer garment, the scripture tells us. He puts an apron on, he gets a towel, he gets on one knee, he takes on the identity of a servant, of a slave. And he says, I'm going to wash your feet. That's what he came to do, he came to serve. And as we read on, Others are like, whoa, 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 Jesus, you're not washing my feet. No, 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 hold on. No, I should be washing yours. Let's flip this out. Let me, no, Jesus, no. I must do this, he says. You know the story is one's like, well, it's just give me a bath, right? Just wash all of me. He says, no, 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 just, just your feet. Jesus humbled himself. He modeled for us what identity in the Father really looks like. Identity that comes from the Word. I want to look at five things this morning, five things that I want to encourage us, I want to remind us of where our identity comes from and how it comes and different ways that God gives it to us, which is going to help us, rooted in us, as we move on in this series together and we hit these tough topics which so many of us are dealing with today. The fact that no matter what we deal with, no matter what struggle we have, through Christ we can have victory. That has to start here. 
The Apostle Paul said himself, take captive every thought, every thought. And I interpret that as, as, as all these thoughts come into my head. Are they, are they God-honoring? I want to get them into my heart. I want them to take root in who I am. Or are they not God-honoring? Are they of the enemy? They're, they're opposite of what Scripture teaches. Then I want them removed. I want them out. I don't want any part of them. If you're like me, you struggle with that. But the first thing is to take captive the thought that we can have freedom. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ can have freedom and be freed from the, the weight, the burden of sin that we're so entrapped in, the chains that, have, chains that have us bound. We need to be reminded of who we are. The first thing is this. We're reminded all through Scripture, and we want to personalize this. You'll see it in your sermon notes. We use the pronoun I. I am fully loved. It starts there. No matter where you have been, no matter where you've come from, you've got to know the heart of the Father that you are fully loved. I've talked to so many people, so many people that says, oh, God can't love me for what I've done. You invite them to church, oh, you don't want me in your church. You're exactly who I want in our church. Because if I can stand here on this stage by some right, I don't know what you call it, by some title, then by golly, anybody can be loved by God and be in this church and be in a church and be in the family of God. You are fully loved. Please know that. We want that, don't we? We want to be loved. We want to feel like we're important. And God looks and you see it all through Scripture. Jesus' life, who did he associate with? Who did he go to? He went to people that nobody else would. He went to people that the Jews were forbidden to even be around. He went to Samaritans. He went to prostitutes. He went to sinners to show them that God the Father loves you. He doesn't like what you're doing, maybe. He doesn't agree with your lifestyle, but he loves you. Why? Because each one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Each one of us. God handcrafted us. You are unique. You are different than anybody else on this planet. And God knows every hair on your head. Those of us that still have hair. I'm sorry, I had to say that. I have so many, oh, never mind. You are fully loved. Look at some of these scriptures. Jeremiah 31, uh, God is reminding them, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, a love that goes on forever. And watch this, with an unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. That same God is the God is telling you that here this morning. I love you with an everlasting love, love that goes on forever. It's unfailing. Doesn't matter what you have done, I love you. Psalm 100, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever, his faithfulness continues through all generations. The first thing is we need to realize we are fully loved. Secondly is this, I am fully valuable. Say that this morning, I am fully valuable. Do you know that? Do you mean that when you say it? Man, I remember growing up uh, on the farm, you know, I've shared this before, and, and, you know, we didn't have a lot, but we had what we needed. We had what we needed, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Then I would have. Now I wouldn't. I'm so glad God brought me through that. And I remember times looking into my dad's eyes, revere that man, even to this day. He was the best man at my wedding. I love that man. And I remember times where he would just, you could see it on his face, he was he was broken. And he's like, oh, I, I failed. I wish I would have. And, and you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't do this, and I wish I'd have done this. And, and finances, you know, on a farm, you're very, very unlikely you're going to be real wealthy. <laughs> and, you know, I wish I would have done this and saved. And I was having a conversation with him here over Thanksgiving. We went to get, uh, pick something up for Thanksgiving dinner, and, and we're driving together. We had about an hour in the car, and, and uh, we're heading over to my sister's house, 
and we just started to really talk. I was driving, and I'm just like, you know what? Uh, we're driving about 60 mile an hour down the highway. He's not going to bail. I got him. I'm just going to say it. And, you know, I, I revered my dad, and there was just things you don't say to your dad, you know? You just don't want to upset him. And I'm just like, Dad, how you doing? And the whole thing with Mom, you know? And, and, and you know, and he said, well, we started talking about some financial things and different things he wished he would have done. I said, Dad, look. I said, look what God's given you. You have got three kids who love the Lord. Perfect by no means, but they love the Lord. You've got three kids who have married godly people. You've got three kids who have families who get along. We're all going to be together, and they love you and mom. I said, Dad, you did something right, and we're following your lead. You see, we want to be valuable even if we don't think we're are, we are. And God says to you this morning, you are fully valuable. Why? Because I made you, he said. And God does not make mistakes. Do you believe that this morning? You are not a mistake. Because God does not make mistakes. He is perfect. You are fully valuable. Look what the scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 7. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. You are his treasured possession. Isaiah 43, I love this. It says, I paid a huge price for you. God says, that's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. Reminding them, do you know what I did for you? I, I paid a huge price. I would do anything for you. You're my treasured possession. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this. If you're a chosen people, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. I don't know where you all are this morning, but I want you to know God says, not me, this is God saying, you are fully loved. You are fully valued. And the third thing is this, you are fully accepted. Say that together. I am fully accepted. Say it again. I am fully accepted. Oh, but I messed up. Yeah, I did too. God says, you are fully accepted. I have made incredible mistakes. God says, you are fully accepted. I've lied. I've cheated. I've got addictions. Those words that were up on that screen, I can identify with about three or four of them. God says, you are fully accepted. We have to embrace that. That's truth. That's coming from the Father of heaven, the Father of lights. That's coming from the one who has created the things that we can and cannot see. That is the one who has things out in space where scientists are still looking every single year, finding something new, another massive galaxy. It's that God that holds all of it in the palms of his hand that says, you are fully accepted. I have all of this. I own it all. I created it all. And I love you that much. I value that, you that much. I accept you that much. I mean, we should be popping ibuprofen right now. That's mind-boggling. I am fully accepted. Look what Scripture says. Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, or Ephesians 1. I love this uh, verse, verse 4. For he chose in him, us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love. That's our God. He chose us. Titus chapter 3. Because of his grace, God's grace, he made us right in his sight. And gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Isn't that what we long for? To say, I want that. I want eternal life. I want to be valued. I want to be accepted that much. And that's what God did for us. I am fully accepted. Now, when we believe those things, when we believe those three things, that God loves us that much, he values us that much, he accepts us that much, and we recognize that we need that, 
Okay, I want that. I want the, that to be fully of who I am. I want that to be my identity. And we make the decision in our lives at it, some moment, wherever it is, to say, God, through your son Jesus, I recognize that he came to, to earth, he walked this earth, he died on a cross, a criminal's death, beyond our comprehension what he went through. And But yet, unlike any other religion on the planet, the, the grave could not hold him down. He rose again. Give me another religion that can boast that. You got nothing, do you? Jesus rose again, and we say, yes, I believe that. I want that to be part of who I am, and we receive the grace that God gives us through his son Jesus. You know what happens next? God looks at you, and he says, you are fully forgiven. Say that with me this morning. I am fully forgiven. Fully. When was the last time you forgave somebody, but you really didn't forgive them? Right? I mean, I'm number one. I, I, I struggle. My own kids. I do in my heart. I forgive them, but then my mind and my actions don't really reflect that. They don't line up. You, you're tracking with me, aren't you? And when you make that decision and you give your life to Christ and you receive that and he says you are fully forgiven, the Bible says your sins are as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. God says, I don't want to talk about them anymore. Let's move on. Wow, really? I don't have to dwell on on my past God? No. I don't have to work? No. I can look forward? Yes. Yes. Someone here needs to be reminded that they're fully forgiven this morning. Forgiven from your past. And being able to see clearly the direction God has for you and move forward. Oh, what a a concept. Look at scripture again, 1 Peter, the next verse there in chapter 2, verse 10. Once you had no, look at this, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Amen? Oh, come on. God says that. That's not me. That's his word. That's beautiful. Isaiah 43. I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgressions, your sins, your your mistakes. For my own sake, God says, and remember, look, watch this. Say it with me. And remembers your sins Oh, really? Maybe just a little bit? Gone. Gone. Paul, Ephesians 1. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in, a, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Who? I am fully loved, I am fully valued. I am fully accepted by the creator of everything. I am fully forgiven because of the decision I made to follow him. Have you made that decision this morning? Or at some point in your life? Now, the beauty of all of this is our fifth point. When we recognize those first four, and especially number four, here's what happens. We can boast and say, I am fully capable. I am fully capable. Oh, I can't do this on my own. You're right. I can't, I can't. No, we can't. But through him, we can. You know, we've talked about this before, before, and I love this picture of the angel armies. When we are up against it, when the enemy has, has brought his regime against us, The fact that the war has already been won, but the battles we struggle with, God's angel armies vastly outnumber what the enemy can bring. And if we could only see it, like the people of old we read about in the Old Testament, it it would be an amazing sight of God's army that surrounds us in every battle we're in. And we are capable through him to conquer the sin that the enemy brings at us. Those words, those things that we struggle with that we're going to talk about throughout this series, through Christ, we are capable to move on from them. We can be freed from them. 
And no, we don't do it on our own. And for guys, that's not easy to take because we're, we're designed, our DNA is to fix things. Well, we're supposed to do that. That's what we're, right? I mean, we're supposed to provide. We're supposed to be the muscle. We're supposed to be the strength. We're, we're supposed to know. We're, we're supposed to know everything. In our own minds, we think that sometimes. And for us to humble ourselves in the sight of someone far greater. Oh, the model that sets. Men, fathers, the model that sets for your your homes, for your kids to see that, vastly greater than anything you could ever say to them when they see you humbling yourself before Almighty God. And to say, God, through your strength, through the blood that was shed, I am fully capable to be the man, the woman, the boy, the girl you've created me to be. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, it's not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He's enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. How can we lock arms with God and be part of what he's doing if we don't have his strength to do it? We'll fail on our own merit. We will. It's through his strength. You know, something that I struggle with so much, and maybe you can relate, is, is, is pride. Growing up, um, playing on sports teams in middle school and high school, and there's just something about arrogance that just turned me off so much. I just would get, oh, it would just drive me crazy to see arrogant people. And, and I took it to a whole new level. I would even see confidence as arrogance, and I really struggled with that, and I had to learn the difference between the two. You know, and I remember some of my teammates on my basketball teams in high school, and, and one, one in particular was just, oh, just the way he carried himself. Oh, I was just like, man, I just want to hit him. I just, but I know my dad would hit me, and that's not good, so I, I'm not going to do that. But, but I struggled with that so much so that I took that into my college years and post-college years to where I could not receive a compliment. And somebody would say, oh, nice this, nice job, did a and I would play it off, oh, no, not really. Well, you know what happens when you do that? You're actually sending a pretty bad message to the person trying to give you that compliment. They're giving it to you for a reason. They want you to receive it. When you don't do that, then, well, why would they give you another one again? And I remember one person in particular, a, a father of a couple kids that I had in a youth ministry before this church, and one of the most humble individuals ever, still to this day, just I, I revere him so much, respect him so much, such a humble man, I remember talking to him, and, and we're talking about this very subject, and he said, you know, Brian, he said, and he plays, uh, plays guitar, sings, he's just phenomenally talented in so many different ways, and he said, you know, anytime I play a song or anytime I, I lead worship or whatever, and, and somebody comes up and compliments me, he said, the first thing I do is I thank them, thank you, and as soon as I possibly can, I turn it right back over to God. God, thank you for that compliment. Thank you for giving me the ability to do what I just did. Thank you that I'm able to honor you with this gift that you've given me. And all that just changes your perspective. That it's not, I'm not doing this for me. It's not about me. I want it to be sometimes because that feels good, right? Gosh, I wish I could sing like these guys and girls up here. I wish I could still play the piano like I did back when I was in middle school. I wish I could do those things, but you don't want me to do that. It's not pretty. But we all have gifts. God has given us gifts because he's created us to be used for his glory. We are capable. We are capable. Paul reminds us of that. Philippians 4, he says too, For I can do what? Everything, all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Not on my own. There's a movie that came out, I think just last year, called Overcomer. I, I, if you haven't seen that movie yet, you've you got to see that movie. And just to give you a little bit of a, a back, background to this, uh, the, the lead character in the movie is John Harrison. He's a high school basketball coach and uh, doing very well and loves, loves coaching. And, and one of the oldest and most, uh, the biggest factories in that town all of a sudden shut down. And hundreds of people moved on. He basically lost his team, lost his basketball team. And so the principal calls him in and says, hey, I, I, you know, sorry about all this. And they're talking through this. And he said, 
She said, I, we've got this cross-country program, and I, I want you to coach it. She said, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about cross-country. I don't even like to run. And, and she says, I want you, you. You are able to motivate people. You have a gift to speak to young people, to teenagers, and, and, and see their full potential. You did that on the basketball court. I want you to do that on the cross-country field. And so he, he reluctantly accepts to find that he's got one member, a girl who's got asthma. He's like, I'm supposed to run cross-country. And, and so he's, he's working through this, and he's just struggling, really, with who he is. And he goes with his pastor from his church to the hospital to visit somebody, and as he's waiting in the hallway there, his pastor went in to talk to this individual. He kind of uh, stumbles into another room, this guy Thomas Hill, who is dying from diabetes. He's lost his sight. The disease has taken his sight from him. And he begins a relationship that he never saw coming with this man. And I want to show you a clip this morning from this movie. Take a look. Sean. If I asked you who you are, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I'm a basketball coach. And if that's stripped away? Well, I'm also a history teacher. Okay. We take that away. Who are you? Well, I'm a husband. I'm a father. And God forbid that should ever change. But if it does, who are you? I don't understand this game. It's not a game, man. Who are you? Um, I'm a white American male. <laughs> yeah, well, that's for sure. <laughs> Is there anything else? Well, I'm a Christian. And what's that mean? It means follower of Christ. And how important is that? It's very important. Interesting. Hi, right, so far down your list. Okay, wait a minute. I could have easily said Christian first. Hey, yeah, but you didn't. Look, John. Your identity will be tied to whatever you give your heart to. Doesn't sound like the Lord asked first place. You're calling me a bad Christian? Let me be a little direct. Last time you were here, you said you'd pray for me. Did you? No. No. For someone who knows the Lord, you're yeah, acting like somebody who doesn't. Which makes me wonder. What have you allowed to define you? When you lost your team, it didn't just disappoint you. It devastated you. Something or someone will have first place in your heart. But when you find your identity in the one who created you, it'll change your whole perspective. There's so many of us here this morning, I believe, that have found our identity in other things. Appearance, achievements, acquisitions, associations. Some of us have found our identity in the words that we had on that screen earlier this morning. find our life a wreck, a mess, more questions than answers. May I suggest this morning that when you have found your identity in the one who created you, it will change your perspective. It will change who you are. And when you hear the words from the Father that says, I am fully loved, I am fully valued, I am fully accepted, I, Brian, is fully forgiven, and through Christ's strength, I am fully capable. The foundation is laid. 
the line is drawn in the sand that you can look at Satan and say, you will not rule me anymore. You will not allow these things that you put in my life to control me anymore. No, 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 we're done. I'm free from that because I am a child of God, the one true God who cares for me that much. Friends, let that be your foundation. May you know, may you be reminded for some of you, for others, may you know the truth of God's word and how he sees you and the value that's in that. We're going to pray and sing another song and then we just have one more thing to do this morning and we'll, we'll wrap it up. But as you sit there this morning as we pray, God's knocking on the door of your heart. May you open it. May it start here in your mind to realize what God is saying. He's saying to you, nobody is exempt from this. And may it penetrate your heart and become really who you are and what you're about. That's how God sees you. Would you please stand with me if you're able as we close in prayer? Let's bow your heads and pray with me. Lord Jesus, We thank you so much for the truth of your word that we can stand here in your presence as men, women, boys and girls and be reminded of how you see us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made by your hands. You handcrafted each one of us. And we're not a mistake the world, society, culture led by the enemy tries to tell us differently. Lord, may we stand here in confidence. May you give us a level of boldness this morning that we can stand up tall and we can boast, we can brag we can have confidence that our identity is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Help us, Father, as we progress in this series and touch on some really difficult topics. May our minds and hearts be open to what you say about them and not completely subject to what others say. May you continually change our perspective. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you.